Hi, this is your host Amil Bharatiya and welcome to our brand new series. And today we are going to discuss the impact of cost cutting that we saw in 2022. And today we have with us once again, Kit Merker, Chief Growth Officer at Noble Line. Kit, it's great to have you on the show. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Uh, last year, uh, we saw a lot of efforts within the industry uh, where a lot of layoffs ha- happen. Companies are looking at cutting cost. Uh, uh, cloud is also people are looking at how to kind of optimize it. The way I see it is sometimes that we are kind of the industry is maturing where we are. I don't look at it essentially as cost cutting. I'm looking at becoming cost efficient or cost effective. If I ask you what kind of trends you saw throughout the year when it comes to either cost cutting or cost effectiveness? Through my lens of, of Noble 9 through our service level objectives, I think, you know, I'm particularly concerned with cost cutting because uh, one company's cost cutting is another company's revenue cutting, if you know what I mean. But the the layoffs create a, a very specific kind of pressure on, uh, especially on uh, technology teams, where they they no longer have the slack in their environment, meaning the the free time to work on uh, projects, and it really changes the calculus for build versus buy decisions. And as we've seen a, a increase in um, availability of mature solutions, of open source solutions, cloud solutions, things like that, it becomes harder and harder, I think, to justify DIY solutions for, for you to build things yourself. And now I've got a couple of, of customers recently um, that told us, you know, number one, that, you know, they would never buy from us because, you know, we, they built, you know, we build everything ourselves and they've come back to us a year later and said, you know what, actually, um, we've changed our mind. The, 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 the economics don't make sense for us to build and maintain this ourselves. And another customer, uh, a retailer in Europe that just uh, told us, you know, they had built a solution a year ago. They thought they were ahead of us. Now they see how much progress we've made. And now they're looking to build it internally. And uh, you know what? It's not just because of us. It's because the economics of building and maintaining these solutions is hard. And when you, uh, you know, especially when now you've got to focus on your core competency um, due to the, the, fi- the time pressure you have of reducing the staff on a team, it really does change the equation. So I, I, I think it's... Um, in some ways, to your point about maturity, you know, this is a signal that some of these IT areas and, and developer tools and cloud infrastructure, things like that, are maturing to the point where you don't need an army of people to, to build and maintain them. In fact, that should be our goal all, all along, should have been to be efficient with this. And uh, efficiency is perhaps one of the most important things uh, businesses are facing. You know, we, we went through an era of growth at all costs, um, and we saw that both from a perspective of investment as well as a perspective of technical debt, I would say. And uh, that growth needs to be tempered with efficiency. I think the, the really the, the goal I like to think of is it's trying to balance between um, excellent service and efficient delivery. And finding that sweet spot that balances those two competing uh, needs is really the trick to running a sustainable, uh, sustainable business. Since you uh, brought the point of open source, uh, open source is very good at solving day one problem. You can download the code, you can get it started. But what commercialization of open source does is that it takes that burden away from you. Still, you know, you have the confidence of using open source code base. You have the confidence of looking into the code. You have the confidence of patching things if you need to. You also have the confidence of moving from one vendor to another vendor, depending on how you look at it. But open source has always been like that. There are a lot of folks who have the resources to. Do that but most companies what is also happening is that you end up wasting so many of your technical resources in plumbing the things that, that does not add any value to your business so so talk a bit once again about you, you touched upon the build versus buy open source um, how how is this going to impact because we will be looking at a lot of you know service providers or you know opinionated services where you're still leveraging it but we are also uh, hearing a lot about cost cutting from the cloud the cloud cost is also becoming a big concern. So talk how to maintain that balance. What are you seeing there? What you're really talking about is opportunity cost. We're talking about opportunity cost and risk. And, and opportunity cost, um, the, the way I think about it is it's, it's the other things you could be doing instead of what you spend your time on. And so what open source represents is it, it's a low low cost in the sense that it's free. You know, it's, it's free like speech, not free like beer, as they like to say. But it is, uh, it is very expensive in terms of opportunity cost. I think that's the point. And so you have to question uh, the dollars that you're spending uh, in terms of opportunity cost versus the, the free software you're getting. Now, you know, the, the ecosystem has become, I think, pretty rich uh, with open source solutions that are available from cloud providers directly, like, you know, sort of your managed Prometheus and these kinds of offerings. 
Um, you also have marketplaces that are full of, of offerings and there's SaaS versions of these open source things. So I think recognizing that open source can support you know, a business, right? Open source is not a business model, but it can support various business models. I think the other thing about open source is it, and to your point about vendor lock-in and, and sort of transparency, right? The, the way that we have approached uh, open source for ourselves has been to open up the APIs and standards for the formats. You know, if somebody, in our case, you know, OpenSLO is the, the open source uh, API we use. If somebody's making an investment in defining SLOs for Noble 9 because they want to build that, that's really their intellectual property, you know, and you're asking them to build code and, and configuration and check-in stuff. Um, you don't want them doing that using a proprietary language with no exit path. Um, if we lose the trust and confidence of our customers, they should be able to take their IP. I think that's just that's just stands to reason. You should take your data and take your IP. And I think customers are, are getting sophisticated about demanding from their uh, vendors that they follow open APIs and that they let them take their data and that they make migration off of their platform uh, actually pretty straightforward. I think that's important. Um, at the same time, you know, you want companies to be productive. So you want that, you know, you want to buy something and get real value out of it quickly um, and to solve those day two problems. All, the other thing that's really plaguing us these days is supply chain security and open source is a, an antidote to that as well. And I think having some transparency uh, where you can see the code and see what's going on is really helpful. But you can't expect companies to give away all of their uh, intellectual property and, and, uh, and products. Um, we need somebody to get paid to build the open source technology as well. But I think for transparency and vendor lock-in, I think it makes perfect sense. But I think buyers or consumers of open source have to be smart about the trade-offs in terms of opportunity cost as well as making sure the people maintaining that project get paid in some way uh, so that they can uh, continue to invest in the in the open source. Let's talk about how SLOs, we, we had this discussion earlier also, kind of actually enables companies to become more cost efficient. So impact of SLO is directly on becoming more so that you know you are actually taking the hacks off from them and giving them a scalpel so they can actually fine tune things so they are actually becoming cost efficient. One of the things I think that is very expensive for organizations is how they handle incidents. You know, it's, it's inevitable that you will have uh, problems in your software, but what's, what's maybe less uh, obvious is that not everything that looks like an incident necessarily is an incident that needs to be dealt with right now. And so if you can reduce the sort of temperature and frequency of emergencies um, and try to find ways to be more proactive, this is a huge improvement right off the bat in, from an efficiency perspective. It means you can redeploy your time and energy to other things versus waking your engineers up at 3 a.m., you know, having them deal with something or acknowledge something that maybe isn't a real issue or can recover on its own. Um, and that comes from having, uh, you know, poorly defined alert policies and uh, metrics that don't necessarily drive customer impact. So that's one right off the bat, something that SLOs help with very clearly. This is, another area it helps with is deciding where to spend your time and energy. You know, if you're working on features and new innovation, but your service is burning down because of technical debt, that's not a good decision. How do you bring visibility to that? I like to say that reliability is invisible until it isn't. And this is where, you know, reliability issues show up in the headlines. Well, the question is, how do you get your business stakeholders to understand the cost of reliability when things are going well? And I think this is another uh, value that SLOs can bring. One, one final thing I'll say about this is, you know, there's a lot of data being generated by observability systems, whether you have metrics, traces, logs, you know, and you may have multiple systems generating data about your, uh, about your running systems. And the question is like, what are you going to use that data for? I think there's a, there's a mindset, which is, you know, you want to get as much data as possible, just in case, right? You want to always have this data. But, but I, I kind of flip this around. I think, well, if the service is running 99.9% .9 of the time well, and only 0.1% of the time is a service having trouble. I mean, in theory, I mean, it's different for different services. But if it's running well most of the time, when are you going to go look at that data? When are you going to go dig into the logs and everything else? And it's not necessarily all of the data that's interesting. So what, what we've decided to do or what we've helped our customers do is actually define the interesting times. You know, whenever there's a software release, there's an outage, there's a near miss, and use that to drive their data retention policy. And so this means they can go upstream to, you know, their uh, log storage system, their metric systems, et cetera, their, their different observability systems, and actually um, select what data to keep uh, based on things that might be interesting for investigations and they use the SLOs to determine what's interesting. Okay. By doing this, you can dramatically reduce the amount of data storage you have um, because you're going to keep the summary data about the SLOs. You're going to keep the interesting moments so you can go back and look at them. You're going to keep the, the annotations and history uh, of, of changes to the system, but you don't need to store 
uh, all of the logs that were generated while a service was running properly. And these kinds of techniques um, are becoming very popular, uh, very intriguing for people, especially the more sophisticated people that are looking at the sticker shock that they have from their uh, observability bills. And I actually talked to quite a few customers where they you know, were trying to move from one system to another to save money. And then they realized that the new system was going to be the same price as the old system. And so they're trying to figure out how to break through uh, that, that challenge um, and use, you know, again, like open source solutions, cloud hosted solutions that are less expensive, but just getting smarter about the data because, you know, data just, it just grows and you just keep paying for it. And at Noble Nine, we don't charge for data ever. Uh, we, we actually have a pretty strict policy on that. So we, you char- we charge only for the running SLOs you're currently collecting. Um, we allow you to export all your data. We store two years of data in our enterprise platform. Um, and so that, that makes it uh, quite a bit more cost effective than uh, just, you know, piling up more and more data. It also aligns the incentives because um, if I was trying to convince you to just sort, you know, if I wanted to make my bill go up, I'd just tell you to collect more data and uh, and then make it harder for you to figure out which data you're going to actually use. Do you have any kind of advice for companies so that, you know, uh, they can not only just like either as low as leverage, approach open source appropriately um, so that they can you know, remain cost efficient. I mean, we can learn a lot of lessons and, you know, implement them the way we run businesses. My biggest advice is, is, you know, one is don't just um, cut costs without the context. You know, uh, this, this idea of being able to make your service efficient and make your team efficient needs the context of the value that you're, you're paying for. And so one of the metrics I think about is sort of the cost to serve right? You want to serve your customers at a certain level, um, but there's a cost associated with that. And if you can get down to those unit economics and truly understand um, the, the, the value, you might be spending a lot of money on cloud, um, but guess what? All of your customer revenue is dependent on that cloud being up and running. So, you know, you can't really just look at it and say, okay, let's cut costs. There are some tried and true methods and low-hanging fruit that you can use. Absolutely. Uh, reserved instances and other kind of cost optimization techniques. Um, but, uh, you know, those have to be put into context. And I think that's the, my, my biggest advice is to make sure that you have that context as you're approaching uh, whatever cost cutting uh, activity you're doing. Um, obviously, you know, being aggressive about cost cutting is really important, um, but at the same time tempered with, um, with an understanding of what's going to break your business as opposed to just, uh, you know, excesses that are unnecessary. Kit, thank you so much for taking time out today and of course talk this uh, very important topic uh, because 2023 is going to be a tricky year for all of us. Uh, but I really appreciate your insights and I look forward to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks so much. Looking forward to it.